for this evening's talk, I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit on the teaching of karma. And uh, this is a um, <clears throat> perhaps the most, one of the first uh, Buddhist concepts which a lot of people encounter. It's become a part of our uh, popular lexicon and uh, has drifted into our culture in many ways. And uh, does get used or gets invoked in a wide variety of forms and uh, context and becomes a way of explaining many different kinds of things, uh, many of which uh, drift quite a long way from what the Buddha was trying to get to when he was talking about karma. So when the Buddha spoke about karma almost always or very frequently, uh, of course the Buddha being very, a very practical gentleman, he uh, <clears throat> spoke in terms of how to accomplish good karma and how to abandon bad karma. And the most characteristic and frequently occurring teaching that he gives on this is what's called the Dasa Kusala Kama Pata. And uh, the ten... Uh, pathways for or ten ways of wholesome karma which is one of those basic Buddhist teachings which uh, everybody should know does anyone who want to list the ten ways of wholesome action Sorry? Not the paramis, no. Nothing to do with the paramis, except there's ten of them. <laughs> and they're wholesome. <laughs> Dasa Kusala Kamapata. Okay. Three by way of body, four by way of speech, three by way of mind. Hang on, I'm running out of fingers here. Three by way of body. Hang on, it's difficult. <laughs> four by way of can't quite get my fingers to work, but uh, I think you get the idea. You go something like that. No, no, no. Three, three by body, four by speech, and three by mind. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, all right. Um, and the, the three by way body are the first three of the th five precepts: not to kill, not to steal, and not to commit sexual misconduct. Okay. So these are the first three. So each of one of those embodies a kind of wholesome act, a, a wholesome karma. So just introduce these first to get a concrete example of the kind of thing that the Buddha was talking about uh, and from there on to move towards a more philosophical understanding. Often we tend to start top down. We start with an abstract conception of something and then we sort of work towards the concrete. Uh, in fact the Buddha usually worked the other way around. So not to kill, what are we doing when we don't kill? Well, the Buddha always emphasized that one is acting out of compassion and especially when one has a heart full, filled with compassion for all sentient beings. And uh, one would, would uh, like be ashamed or would with, withdraw or recoil from any act that would bring harm to any living being. And so this is, this is, that's that one way of wholesome karma. Another way of wholesome karma is to not steal. Okay, so this one is uh, respecting the the property and the trust of others. Okay, that when we we take something that belongs to to others, that uh, causes them suffering. It's something which they own. They have they have uh, a feeling of possession for that they have a need for. We take that and it causes them suffering. Uh, and so this is uh, another thing that has come up, uh, brings suffering to others. And uh, sexual misconduct 
if we are uh, betraying our partner uh, or uh, acting in a sexual relationship in a way that uh, causes uh, harm, then of course again that brings a tremendous amount of suffering into that relationship. So even though we want to be in a relationship from a, se from a sense of love, a sense of mutual respect, a sense of trust, that's, that's what we're seeking and what our partner is seeking in that relationship. Uh, by betraying that, I should hardly need to mention that the, the depths of the suffering that that can cause. So this is the three kinds of uh, unwholesome karma, or obviously unwholesome if you break them, uh, wholesome karma. Then there's the four by way of speech is lying, it's false speech. Uh, a harsh speech, okay, so abusing people, swearing at them and so on. Uh, Divisive speech, yeah, backbiting uh, and s slander and so on. And then the last one is uh, mindless gossip. This is one of the hardest ones to, <laughs> to keep. Right. And so again, in each way, these things can cause a lot of harm. And again, we, you know, we know through our lives that each one of these things, uh, if we're using our speech in the wrong way, can cause a tremendous amount of harm. And I always think you have, you have this schoolyard saying, you know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. I always think how stupid that saying is. In fact, it's exactly the opposite, isn't it? Someone throws a stick at you, it just bounces off, and so what? Right? When people say things about you, it can really cause a lot of harm. Yeah? So it's another way of causing harm. And then three kinds of mental action mental karma, um, covetousness, okay, uh, ill will, and wrong views. So what these, what these three are is really strong forms, like you probably hear in Buddhism, of like greed, hatred, and delusion, yeah? these kind of uh, forces within us which bring, bring suffering. And these these three are really kind of strong forms of greed, hatred, and delusion that cause us to, that, that are kind of bad karma. Yeah? So, covetousness is a like like a, a kind of a, a, a lingering on kind of you know wanting something that belongs to other you know kind of you know uh, 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 you know it's, it's like it's not it's not it's not it's not just merely wanting something. Okay, so it's not just you know seeing some kind of food and thinking, oh, that's going to be tasty. Yeah, so maybe there's a bit of greed in there, but that's not what's meant here. What's meant is 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 a kind of is is those kinds of of mental acts which are actually become twisted and excessive. And they use this phrase in the Pali, visama lobha, which means almost like uh, distorted greed. Yeah. So this is what really is being meant here. So in these dasakusala kamapata, it's not a transcendental teaching. So this is not about overcoming these things completely. It's just about managing them within reasonable bounds. All right? And so this is what's meant here, is that excessive uh, covetousness or excessive ill will. Yeah? And so, of course, we, we always get you know, a bit annoyed by something or a bit tense or something like that, but it's when that kind of erupts into road rage or whatever. And this is what's being talked about here. And then wrong view. And wrong view doesn't mean uh, like having a, a mistaken idea about something. It doesn't mean, you know, which bands you prefer or whether you vote Labour or Liberal or something like that, nor does it refer to uh, <coughs> believing in different uh, religions or something like that. What it really means is um, having uh, kinds of uh, views which undermine the possibility for living a good life and for having spiritual development. So, for example, having the view that uh, um, there's no such thing as goodness in the world, right? Whatever you do, good or bad, it doesn't matter. Yeah? This kind of view, it's very kind of becomes very nihilistic and undermines an ethical life. So these kinds of things is what's meant by wrong view in this context. So this is the three by way of body, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, four by way of speech, lying, false speech, oh, sorry, lying, uh, harsh speech, divisive speech, and gossip. And three, by way of mind, covetousness, ill will, and wrong views. So these are the ten akusala kamapata, unwholesome ways of conduct. If you, if you, 
if you break these and if you keep them is the ten kusala kamapata. And these are regarded in the Buddhist tradition as being what they call manusa dhamma, is the, the, the dhammas, the principles which are appropriate and which pertain to the human realm. Okay? In other words, if you break these things, if you can't keep these, you're not a proper human anymore. Yeah? You, you become subhuman. Yeah? You're acting in a way which, which is not worthy of the state of being a human. Right? If you're somebody who goes around killing, for example, yeah? you, you're, you're kind of undermining an essential part of our humanity by doing that, an essential part of our dignity. Is, and and you're, also, you're also undermining the, the, um, the capacity for us to live together in a human society, in a human culture. So this is called Manusa Dhamma. So these are, these are, when the Buddha talked about Kama, these are the kinds of things which he talked about very, very frequently. So we can get an idea for what he's meaning there. Is he's, he, each, each one of those Kamas is a kind of intentional act, right? And it's an intentional act which results in or influences uh, suffering, uh, of both of oneself and of others. Okay, so that means there's a number of important things, important points that we've learned there. Yeah? One is that it's not merely just any old thought, any old act, anything we do, which is karma. Right? So if, uh, if, if uh, somebody gives us an orange or an apple and says, which one would you prefer, and you choose the orange over the apple, that's not karma. Okay? That's just having an orange. Right? That's, 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 that's not a karma thing, right? If you hit them over the head with a stick and take both the orange and the apple, that's karma, right? Yeah? Uh, or if you say, I'll have the orange, you take the orange and you give that to a starving person, then that also is karma. Yeah? But just choosing one or the other, there's nothing. Yeah? That's just you know, choosing what you're going to have. So karma isn't any kind of intention or any kind of act. It's specifically those ones which have an ethical or a moral content to them. And in the sense that they influence the suffering and the happiness of oneself and of others. Right? Uh, and also notice that in each case, each one of those kamas is a kind of act. Right? It's a choice. It's a choice to act in a certain way. It's not something which we're compelled to do. Okay? So in each one of those cases, and there's no notion of determinism. We're not being forced to do one or other of these things. We are the ones who choose to do that. So the Buddha said very famously, most famous statements about karma, he said, Jetanaham bhikkhuve kamang vadami. It is intention that I call karma. Okay? It's intention, it's will. Karma is will. What is your intention is the karmic uh, uh, content of something. And so it's, it's, it's will or intention. But again, to qualify that, it's not just any will or intention. Yeah, it's not a, just an ordinary, meaningless choice. Okay? It's a choice which actually is, has ethical consequences. And each, each one of those uh, examples of karma which the, which the Buddha gives in those ten ways of wholesome karma, each one is, uh, 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 we, we recognize is an ethically significant um, domain which... Um, which is something which is uh, quite, it's quite, it's quite, it has a certain weight to it. It's something which we realize is an important area of life which is, which is worth reflecting on. There's a certain importance to each one of those choices. And so again, it's not just the, the trivial choices which we're making day by day, it's the important choices in our life which are, which are the things which direct our karma. So this is, this is the kind of idea which the Buddha was pointing to when he was talking about karma. Now, one to, to go further or to go deeper into the notion of karma, I'd like to just, just withdraw back a little bit from the Buddhist teaching on karma and have a look to where that teaching was coming from. Now, the word karma, uh, as you say, we pronounce it karma in Pali, karma in Sanskrit, is it literally means action or work. This is a literal, literal translation of it. It's from the verbal root karoti, meaning to do. And it's a very, very common word. It's a, it's a, it's a 
basic, ordinary, everyday word which is used in many, many contexts every day. So if you, if you were to say, oh, I'm, I'm going off to work today, you'd say, I'm going off to do karma today. Right? That's, that's how common it is. It means just the work that you go off to do. I'm going to go and plow the field. That's doing my karma for the day. Yeah? So that's, how, that's the kind of the ordinary language usage of it. But in the Indian society and in the, the uh, philosophical or religious traditions of the Indian, uh, uh, especially the, the Brahmanical tradition, Kama had, uh, had developed or, or also had a notion of ritual. Okay? So a Kama is, something, is a ritual which you do. And it's not immediately, because we live in a very secularized age, it's not immediately obvious to us what is the relationship between a ritual and work. We usually we think those two things are quite different. Yeah? So if you've grown up, as I grow up in a Catholic family, you know, Sunday is your day off. That's when the day you go and do your ritual. You go to Mass. Yeah? That's the day when you're not working. Yeah? So there seems to be quite different kinds of things. So to, to why are those two ideas bound up? I find it's... it's, it's very interesting to then reflect and go back further. Often you find that when, when concepts have become differentiated in a culture, that as we trace the culture back further and further and further, that we come to a time when, when, when things were simpler and those differentiated concepts were actually were, were the same thing. And I think, and this may be controversial, and it's a very speculative uh, idea, but I think that you can trace that notion right back to the earliest cave paintings. And if you look at the uh, cave paintings of, say, uh, uh, you know, very many of the, the ancient paintings, you can see things like, say, a picture of, say, a buffalo. Let's take, a, take an ordinary example. Here's a painting on a cave of a buffalo. And very often the, the buffalo will have a spear stuck in it or something like that. Yeah? So... Actually, what's going on? Well, first thing, of course, we say is we don't really know what's going on, so we just we can only speculate. But it seems to me likely that that one of the things that was happening was that that, that the drawing of these paintings was an act of uh, a, 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 a sort of a semi-magical act that, in a sense, was like and is similar to what we do when we draw a plan of something. Yeah, we want to build a, a house; we draw a picture of it. Yeah. This is, what we're going to, this is what we're going to do. This is the comma that we're going to do. We've drawn a picture. Yeah? And so you could imagine that if you've got, say, a tri group of tribes people, right? now they want to go and kill a buffalo or a woolly mammoth or something like that. Now you can imagine it might be a bit difficult to persuade people to go and kill a woolly mammoth. right? <laughs> I would need some persuading. right? You know, it's like a, like a football team. You, know, you have to sort of... You, know, you'll, you'll have to create a sense of a common purpose. Where are we actually moving? Yeah? How do you motivate people to say, this is what we're going to do? And so you can imagine that by drawing these pictures, you're actually creating and focusing the will of the tribe in that act. Yeah? You're bringing them together. This is what we're going to do tomorrow. Yeah? When the light comes up, we're going to, do, we're going to find the animal that we're looking for. Yeah? So you building these ideas of success and positive thinking and co everyone's got a coherent because you can objectify your idea it's not just one person's idea you've objectified it everyone can share in that and it will help to focus and motivate their act and so that as a ritual act I believe would have been one of the purposes of that would have been to help to focus and to enable that the, the hunt to be, be successful and that hunt would be one of the earliest acts, or earliest kinds of karma. Yeah. In, in uh, later times, and in the more uh, agricultural times, the karma became closely associated with the, the field and the growing of grain. Yeah. And the Buddha actually gave the example in one sutta, kamang ketang vinyanang bijang tanha sneho, which means uh, karma is the field, uh, consciousness is the seed and craving is the moisture. Right? Karma is the field, consciousness is the seed and craving is the moisture. Right? So here the Buddha is using that agricultural simile uh, to try to 
illustrate a very important point of the Dhamma. When we think about um, uh, our life, we think about who we are, you know, we have this kind of fleshy thing here, which goes around and uh, lives its life, makes its choices, grows up, learns things, gets married, gets divorced, gets in fights, eats, goes to the toilet, has a bath, gets sick, gets better, all of those things, and then eventually lies down on the ground, rots and disappears. Okay? That's it. And really, everything is just a kind of variation on a theme, isn't it? You know, there's, there's not much more to it than that. Right? You, can, you can sort of spin out the details, but that's about it. Now, then what happens? Right? What happens when, you, when your body's lying useless as a rotten log, as the Buddhist verse has it? So one of the things that, that religions like to, to uh, do is to, to come up with an answer to that question. They like to say, uh, well, something else happens after you die. You know, your, your soul leaves your body and lives in eternal bliss with the one God. Or um, your, your, your little self becomes reunited with the great cosmic self or something. Or they say... Um, that you get reborn in another form. Okay, so there's a few standard answers to that question of what happens to you after death. Some days in the in the say say the ancient Greeks, for example, they basically after death you went to this kind of sort of fairly grey, banal kind of realm. They, the, the Greeks didn't have this idea of kind of very vivid heaven and hell with like lots of you know blissful and, and suffering and so on. But it was more just kind of a bit kind of. Um, kind of being stuck in the public service for the rest of eternity or something like that. It's this kind of fairly, <laughs> it's kind of, it's this kind of nothing realm. So there's different ways of looking at it. Uh, and of course, one of the ideas, one of the ways of answering this question is the idea of what we call reincarnation or rebirth. Yeah? And of course, that idea is very common in India and many other places around the world. So, according to the idea of, of uh, uh, rebirth or reincarnation, when you die, uh, even though your kind of gross material body uh, falls away, uh, you get reborn in another form, which may be another human, or perhaps in another form as an animal or some other kind of being or whatever. And the, the, the force that propels that is the force of your karma. Okay? So karma is like the energy which drives that. So in that simile which I mentioned before, kamang ketang vinyanang bijang tanha sneho, you think of that, that as an illustration of that process of rebirth. Yeah? You have karma as the field, which in a sense a field is a very passive image, but also a field in, in an agricultural culture is the place of work. So you have to remember that that's the connotation that it has. The field is the place that you go to plow. Yeah? So it doesn't have an entirely passive feel to it. Vinyanang bijang, consciousness is the seed. And consciousness is, is the seed in a very literal sense. That if we think, well, what is the seed? Say in a, in a modern biological sense, where you think, well, a seed actually... Uh, the important part of a seed is the, the DNA that it carries. Yeah? So the DNA is a code which contains the information necessary to create a new organism. Right? So consciousness is like that. Right? So consciousness is like something which has an imprint of a code of information which can create a new organism. Right? So I'm not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not saying that consciousness is that. It's saying consciousness is like that. Right? It's a metaphor, so we don't take it too literally, but it's giving us a good idea of what role consciousness plays in that process of rebirth. And then tanha sneho, craving is the moisture. Yeah? So without craving, then uh, the seed will dry up, the field will dry up, and there won't be any new plant being born. 
So these three things together uh, will, will make the process of, of rebirth happen. So this is pointing to uh, a role for karma which is uh, beyond or more, more has, a, has a greater dimension than the, the simple ethical principle which we were discussing at the beginning. Okay? So we have this idea that good karma is just of doing good acts and so on, bad karma doing bad acts. According to Buddhism, one of the important things is that is the idea of cause and effect. So karma is an act, literally meaning is act, work, doing, and that is a cause, and that cause has an effect. That's the point of karma, that cause has an effect. So when we make our choices, we have to live with them. Right? Kama dayado, uh, we are the owner of our kamas, the heir of our kama, uh, born of our kama, supported by our kama. Whatever kama we should do for good or for ill, of that we shall be the heir. So this is a daily reflection which the Buddha urged people to do, to continue to reflect on the karma. Whatever karma I do, for good or for bad, of that I will be the heir. Right? Not somebody else. I will be the heir of that. So it's, a, it's quite a, uh, uh, a demanding teaching, a teaching of responsibility. It's a very adult teaching. It's not a teaching that somebody is going to come along and take care of things for you. The Buddha never promised that. He never said, let me take care of all your bad karma for you. I'll take that off your shoulders. No, no, no. He said, you take care of it. It's your job. So again, just to come back to those roots of the idea of karma, kind of the evolution of the idea of karma, we have this idea to do, we have this work, we have this like unity of the work and the ritual, which gradually over time became separated. And so... In the Vedic tradition, the Brahmanical tradition, which preceded the Buddha, you had this idea of karma as a particular ritual which was done within a, a circumscribed sacred space that involved uh, sacred acts, sacred, uh, uh, such so, you know, prostrating in a certain way or something like that, sacred words, so the reciting of the words of the Vedas, and and the use of sacred implements. Uh, and so the, the, the materials of the sacrifice, which may be ghee, it may be uh, sacrificial animals or whatever, and also sacred persons, yes, yeah, so who would be the, the priests and the various functionaries in the ritual. And so you had a, a circumscribed sacred space where, where with particularly defined roles and functions, and a ritual was performed in order to have a certain effect Okay, so the ritual wasn't just something which was believed to uh, um, you just do to pass the time or because it's the done thing or something. It was done because it was definitely believed to have a certain effect, uh, which may be, depending on the ritual, could have just about any effect. It could have anything from you know, black magic rituals where you, you know, put a curse on somebody who you don't like. Uh, all the way on to, to rituals which would uh, maintain the cosmic order, make the sun rise in the morning. Yeah? So the Brahmins in India do a, a ritual every morning so that the sun will keep on rising. Yeah? And uh, so this whole variety of things, but it's got a causal role. Now at a certain point in the evolution of that idea, then the question arose is, well, what about the attitude and the state of mind of the people participating in the ritual. How does that affect things? Right? If somebody's doing the ritual and their mind's absent, it's wandering, they're not thinking about it, they're just going through the motions, is that still effective? Does that work? Yeah? Or not? And so that's a critical juncture in religious history, you know, you, once you reach that point. And of course, as society evolves and as people's religious consciousness becomes more uh, subtle and reflective, then they say, well, actually, the important thing is the spirit with which you do the ritual. Yeah? And even if not every detail of the ritual is done properly, as long as it's done with the right spirit, it will still work. And this was the point which the Brahmanical tradition had reached before the Buddha came. And they'd even said, well, look, if you can't actually get to do the ritual, as long as you do it out of faith, as long as you do it in your heart, then that's good enough. It still has the effect. Yeah? 
So we've had this internalization of kama, where it's no longer regarded as an external ritual done by a group of people, but it's something which is your internal intention. And so the Buddha, as it were, carried that doctrine of kama through and uh, uh, brought it to completion. The other Buddhist school, oh, sorry, the other religious school in the time of the Buddha was the Jains. And the Jains had a kind of in-between idea of karma. But the Jains actually thought of karma as a quasi-material substance. Okay, So karma is almost like a kind of subtle substance which pervades your body and which you have to almost cleanse your body out, out of by doing various austerities. Okay. Now, it's very important to understand this view of the Jains and what they were teaching of karma. They believed that because of the, 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 the bad acts which you'd done in your past life, that these created this subtle matter of karma in, which was manifest in your body, and that karma could only be burnt out by doing austere practices, okay? by torturing yourself. Yeah? And that torturing would create a fire they called tapas. And that tapas would, as it were, would burn off that bad kama. Okay? So it's the idea that you've got a certain quantity of that kama which needs to be dispelled and burnt off before you can find peace and happiness. When the Buddha approached these the Jains and asked them about this, he said, you know, they were doing all their ascetic practices, standing on one leg and, you know, pulling their hair out and, like, literally pulling their hair out. And uh, all the other things, Jains used to do all kinds of things. Like they wouldn't, after they ordained, they wouldn't have a bath for the rest of their life. Right? So that's, it's, in a sense, it's a kind of generosity. It's like encouraging others to participate in your ascetic practices as well uh, as doing it yourself. But, um, uh, and they went naked and all of these kinds of things. So the Buddha's asking them, why do you do all these kinds of things? They say, well, we want to burn off our past karma. And the Buddha said, well, do you know how much karma have you burnt off? They said, well, we don't know. They said, how much karma do you have? Well, we don't know. How much longer do you have to keep burning the karma off? Oh, we don't know. When are you going to reach the end of this process? When are you going to burn all your karma off? We don't know. Yeah? And, uh, and, the, and then the Buddha said, how does this karma get burnt off? It gets burnt off by experiencing pain. By experiencing pain, the karma gets burnt off. But the Buddha said, well... And we, but, but when you do these ascetic practices, like if you just sort of stand on one leg for days at a time, do you feel that painful feeling? They said, yeah. And he said, but when you don't do the ascetic practice, do you feel the painful feeling? And they said, yeah. And they said, well, doesn't the painful feeling caused by your doing what you're doing here and now? It's caused by you doing these ascetic practices. It's not isn't it, it's not caused by your past karma. It's caused by what you're doing here and now. And they said, we don't care. We're happy with what we're doing. We're going to keep on doing it. Right? So this is the Buddhist critique of Jainism. And it's very important to understand it because I would contend uh, that it's very, very common, in fact, almost universal, that within Buddhism the, the, the view of karma is in fact a Jaina view. And this is taught time and time again. And this view of karma is, is taught in that way. Karma is like is something which... Which, you, which is a kind of a destiny or a fate which you have to, which, which, you, which you can uh, try to um, uh, burn off. And so, so in some of the meditation schools, they'll tell you that when you're sitting in meditation, for example, you sit in meditation and you, know, you feel the various kinds of painful feeling and so on, and this is your past karma which is burning itself off. And as you sit through the course of the meditation, this painful feeling will, will burn itself off and then your karma is dissipating. Okay? That, that's Jainism. It's not a Buddhist view. Okay? Don't believe it. You ask the same question that the Buddha asked. How much of this karma have I got to burn off? Yeah? You can keep on going and doing more and more meditation retreats and the pain will keep on coming. Yeah? Yeah? And then you ask yourself, when is this going to end? You say, I don't know. It's going to keep on going. <laughs> Things keep on going. When you get up from your meditation seat, does the pain go? Yes, the pain goes away. Pain doesn't say, isn't the, isn't, doesn't the pain come from trying to maintain your posture here and now in that position? That's what's causing the pain. Yeah? It's a physical reaction that comes from keeping the body still when the body's not designed to be still. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with your past karma. Nothing whatsoever to do with it. Okay? 
So this is not the Buddha's teaching on karma. The other kind of teaching on karma which you have, which comes from the Brahmanical tradition, came when um, there was this... As in, in Indian civilization, as the course of Indian civilization evolved, and especially when you came to a time of urbanization, which uh, occurred in the maybe three or four centuries before the Buddha, okay? it was a gradual process of urbanization. And in that period, uh, as the society became more complex, there's more stratification in society, more divisions in society and so on. And so it became necessary to develop uh, an ideological or, or theological justification for the inequalities which were found in society. Okay? In other words, the guys at the top needed to develop some kind of plausible spin that could explain why it's right that they're on the top and all the other guys down the bottom. Okay? That still goes today. These days we call it monetarism. Yeah? Uh, or uh, supply-side economics was another good one that they use, and it, it, this is doing exactly the same thing. It's explaining why we at the top deserve even more, and you at the bottom should be grateful that you have the opportunity to give it to us. Right? Uh, and in those days, they developed the theory of what they call the four varnas, the four castes, which is the Brahmins, Kshatriyas, uh, Vesas, and Suddhas, uh, which essentially with the Brahmins is the, the ritual... Uh, and priestly caste, who would not only they would not only do particularly religious functions, but they would also have like a uh, um, in a sense they were the, they were kind of the intellectual caste. They have a philosophical advisory role and so on. They had the kshatriyas were the the noble warrior caste, uh, and the the vesas were the uh, merchants, and the suddhas were the workers. Uh, and then, of course, you had various outcasts outside of that system. Now, this is the origins of what we know today as the Indian caste system. Okay? It's important to understand that in the time of the Buddha, the caste system that we know today didn't exist. Right? So these days in India, of course, every village has its own occupation and there's this endless subdivision of thousands of castes and things like that. There's no hint of anything like that in the India of the Buddha's time. There was Instead, there was this fairly broad division <coughs> into four classes, which actually is not that different from what we find in Europe in, say, later times or in medieval times, when you also had, like, the clergy, you had the kind of the nobles and the merchants and workers, and it wasn't that the serfs, it wasn't that dissimilar uh, in, in the structure. But what they did do was that they, uh, instead of just acknowledging the fact that there was this differentiation in society, the, 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 the problem started with the, the mythologizing of that and the essentializing of it, to say that it's not merely the case that you happen to be a worker or you happen to be a merchant, but that it is your karma to be a merchant, it's your karma to be a, a worker, yeah? it's your karma to be born where you are, and that is your destiny. That is what you must do from the time you're born till the time you die. And if you're doing anything other than that, you're betraying your essential nature. Okay? And so it becomes your duty to to follow through with that. And if you're not actually uh, 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 living in accordance with your karma, I, in this sense, in this, not the Buddhist sense of karma, this in the Brahmanical sense of karma as destiny, then you are uh, going against the cosmic order. Okay? You're like betraying, you're, you're breaking apart, literally, the nature of the cosmos, you know, going against the, the nature of things. And so this doctrine of karma became a teaching which can... Uh, uh, justify any sort of, of uh, uh, injustice, any sort of inequality, any sort of cruelty can be justified according to this doctrine of karma. And this has had, a, I think, an extremely malicious effect on Indian culture. If you go there today and, and you, know, you see the appalling situation that the outcasts have, the Dalits, and... Uh, unbelievable social degradation that they suffer. And, of course, the ideology is, well, that's their karma. Right? There's no need to even bother thinking about them, doing anything to help them. That's their karma. The reality is that that's become an ideology whereby the upper castes can have, uh, effectively, a slave caste. Okay? So the, the Dalits become, basically, slaves for the upper caste. 
So it justifies a, a terribly uh, inequitable social order. And so this is a misuse of karma which comes from that Brahmanical system which the Buddha explicitly rejected and very firmly rejected. Not, this is not an inference, it's not a speculation. He explicitly came up against this and he said, no, it's different. He said when, for example, animals are born according to their karma, a bird is born in the nature of a bird, a, uh, a, a donkey is born in the nature of a donkey, a horse is born as a horse, and there's nothing they can really do about that. Right? But with humans, we have the nature of choice and we can choose what to live with our life. And it's our choice, what we do, that defines our life. Yeah? And so we can choose to be a potter. We can choose to be a blacksmith. We can choose to uh, build a house. Or we, can, we can have choices in our life and those choices define uh, who, we can't, who we become. So he explicitly said that our life, our karma that we make as humans is what is the choices we make in how to live our life. So even within Buddhism today, this, this, this Brahmanical notion of karma has infected and perverted uh, the Buddhist thinking in terms of karma and serves to justify inequalities and social uh, evils within Buddhism just as it has done within Indian society. Uh, and uh, you know some examples, for example, the the, the uh, child sex slavery in in Thailand. Uh, you know, girls 13 years old taken from their families and uh, sold by their parents, taken to Bangkok and forced to work as sex slaves. It's their karma. Why don't you do? Why don't we do anything about it? It's their karma. You know? these are the kinds of things which you hear in in societies where these uh, doctrines become. Dominant, right? So it's very important to recognize that these are nothing to do with the Buddha's notion of karma. Natural disasters, yeah, the tsunami, yeah, <laughs> it was their karma. They were fishermen. They killed fish, therefore they got this. That's rubbish. It's nothing to do with their karma, okay? You hear these kinds of things constantly when disasters happen or things happen, then, then people will say, this is, this is their karma, that's their karma. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with their karma. Karma is the choices that people make in how to live their lives. That is your karma. The things that happen to us in our life come from many different causes for many different reasons. And we all know that. It's common sense. To say that everything happens to you because of your karma is wrong. The Buddha explicitly denied this. And it doesn't make sense. It doesn't agree with any kind of common sense view of the world. We know that you know, global warming is happening. Yeah? Well, is global warming to do with my karma? Yeah? Is, is it your fault? Did we all do the same act that we all happen to be living in a planet with global warming? Are we all equally responsible for that? Well, yeah, we can say in a sense that hum humanity has made choices which lead to global warming. So that, that in a sense, we can understand that. But, you know, humanity... Humanity. I mean, who's who's making those choices? Yeah, not not everybody's made those choices. Yeah, some people have contributed a lot to that global warming. Yeah, others have contributed almost nothing. But we all experience the results equally. So this this is not again is not the Buddhist notion of karma to think about it in that way. What is our choice? How are we going to live our life? And we're going to have to be responsible to live with the results of those choices. This is what the Buddha was talking about when he was talking about karma. So it's important to notice that the, that the doctrine of karma also has... Uh, the, Buddha, the Buddha talked about four kinds of karma. The karma which is uh, bright with dark result... Sorry, bright with bright result. Karma which is dark with dark result. Karma which is uh, both bright and dark with both bright and dark results, and karma which is neither bright nor dark and has neither bright nor dark results. Yeah? So the first kind of karma is good karma. Give some money to poor people. You're making good karma. It's a, good, it's a wholesome action. makes you feel happy uh, now and also makes you ha happy later. Yeah? This is bright with bright results. Dark karma. Yeah? Kill somebody or do something very naughty. You feel bad about it. Others are hurt and so on. Dark and dark. These ones are simple. They're straightforward. Anyone can understand that. And then you have both 
bright and dark karma with both bright and dark results. It's very important to remember that the Buddha acknowledged this category. Okay? So the Buddha did not teach a moralistic dualism. Okay? He did not say everything is either good or bad. Okay? Very important to notice because often when we come to areas of ethical or moral dilemmas, we want to know what is the right thing to do? What is the right choice? Yeah? But the very fact that it's a dilemma suggests that maybe there is no right choice. Maybe there is no bright karma with bright result. Maybe there's no dark karma with dark result. Maybe actually any choice we make is going to be bright and dark and has bright and dark results. Yeah? And when we look at the very painful choices that we have to make in our life, like the choice we were discussing earlier, have a dog, pet dog with cancer, do we euthanize the dog or do we allow it to live? And what would we do there? Yeah? Yeah? It's a very difficult choice. What would we do if we were in that situation? Is it valid for us to infer from my choice to what the, our dog would want? Yeah? The dog's experiencing pain. Fair enough, we would like to help it get out of that pain. We want to ease the pain. That's a wholesome karma. Yeah? But the very fact that it feels pain does not mean that it doesn't love life. Yeah? Because the, the love of life and the will to live is very tenacious and clings on, even in the face of hopeless obstacles. So you can't assume that just because somebody is very sick or an animal is very sick, that therefore it wants to die. That's a different matter. Yeah? And so that kind of thing... It's black and white, and has we have to admit it's black and white, and it will have black and white results. Yeah, so we can't uh, and we can't expect life to always offer us simple and clear choices. And the third category is neither dark nor bright, with neither dark res results. But this is the kama which leads to the ending of kama. Okay, so these are those choices which are done with the wisdom and with the understanding of the four noble truths. Yeah, with the understanding of dependent origination with the understanding of letting go, with the understanding of the relinquishment of any kind of attachment, and especially with attachment to, say, the results of what one does. And so this kind of karma, uh, that, that means that uh, this kind of karma is, say, the choices which we make or which can be made from an enlightened perspective. So even, for example, you look at the Buddha. The Buddha was a very decisive person. Okay? And when he became enlightened, became awakened, he didn't just sit around passively, not doing anything for the rest of his life. He was a very active, engaged person. He was constantly wandering about the place, teaching, advising, helping people in all kinds of ways. So there was the, he, he, and he was very, very decisive and would very cl make very clear choices. So the fact that he became enlightened didn't mean that he couldn't make karma in the sense of making choice. Okay? But it just meant because he wasn't attached to that, he wasn't making it out of delusion, he wasn't making it out of greed, hatred and delusion or any kind of feeling of the results of that, that therefore that, those acts just stopped there. Okay? Black and white, neither black nor white karma that leads to neither black nor white results. So these are a few reflections on the notion of karma for you all this evening. So I offer that to you for your uh, amusement and edification. And does anybody have any comments?